just really want to give it up for Robin. She's going to be talking to us today. Thank you so much, Robin, for um, taking time out of your day to speak to some of our attendees. We really appreciate it. And um, feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself and get started. Okay, so hi, my name is Robin Moxkey. I'm Stockbridge Mohican Muncie. I'm a graduate of two tribal colleges. And I started off as a coder, and we can get a little more into how I got into that. And now I currently work in sort of the intersection of technology and creating experiential experiences, which sounds very nebulous, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I would like to say I like panels to be a little more inclusive and a little more intimate. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to like, I don't know if you guys are taking them in the chat or whatever, but I, I'm okay with people asking questions throughout this because there's a lot of things within the story or what I'm gonna say that maybe people want a little more information on. So with that, if chat's open, feel free to ask questions during this. Yeah, feel but, free to do that or um, you can unmute as well. That works for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about was like centering, using tech to center around marginalized communities. And how do you do that when a lot of communities are not even at the forefront of having access to tech and coming from a reservation community in a small community um, also coming from poverty um, these are all things that add to marginalization you can find this also lack of competencies in language and or mainstream culture meaning like people don't even understand when it comes to programming a lot of it is couched in English, even though you're dealing with numbers, there's this idea that English is at the forefront, this culture is at the forefront. Um, and then also, where do you begin if you don't have people in your community that are involved in tech? Do you even see yourself in it? And growing up, I never, I learned how to code solely because I wanted like a sparkly MySpace page. I'm from that era. And I remember like, everyone was having these blingies and these gifs that would like, I was like, how did they make these? And so back then you had to use HTML, like you couldn't just like copy and paste. So I learned that and I was around like 10 at the time, 10 or 11. And then I realized, oh, like this starts this, I think it's a natural curiosity, especially like all of you guys are so young. You, this is perfect because there's this natural curiosity that you have about how things work. And I remember feeling so empowered when I realized I can tell a computer what to do and I can make it do this. And so there was like this entire world that I'm creating online. I'm going back home because we didn't even have a computer at home. I was using the computer at the public library and I would create these things. And at one point my blog got shortlisted by the United Nations and yet I'm going home to, to a place where this had no relevance. And so it was really interesting for me, but I never viewed myself as a person in tech. Like I, and like most coders, I think you start off learning one language and then you realize, hey, this other language can do so much more. And so I started off with HTML, but then I went to JavaScript and then I went to CSS and then I went to like Python because Python can do so many cool things. And again, I didn't see this translate to my to my day-to-day -day life outside of the internet. Um, so I didn't view it as even possible for me to have a career in technology. I didn't view myself as a technologist. It wasn't until I had an internship years later that I was in college. I was interning for the first time in DC and I had to do, I was, I was compiling research on tribal colleges because again, it's also really important when, I think when you go into tech, just the idea of like, I want to work in tech. I mean, that's great, but also what do you want to do with it? Because it's, it's basically a device. You're using your creativity and your passion mixed with it. What do you want to create? And so in my case, I didn't even know I was going into tech. I was just focused on my community and specifically at that time, education and access to education was super important to me. So I had decided to take on this project where I was going to focus on tribal colleges. The problem was there wasn't already an existing database of stats that I could pull. So to get around it, I was like, I'll just compile, like, I'll just create a compiler out of Python, which, you know, can pull this data for me. So I did it solely to get out of doing work 
my boss found out I thought I was in trouble <laughs> and she was like whoa, whoa, whoa like if you could code this why aren't you in tech and as odd as it seems like it never dawned on me that a person like me could go into tech or what I was doing was technical because again with enough time and with enough creativity I, I firmly believe anyone can learn how to code granted I think it's also about finding the language that works for you and we can get into that in a bit but I remember she was just like, well, have you ever thought about going into to tech? And it was like, no, I mean, what is tech gonna do for me? Like, how is it gonna help? And sp again, at that time, I was really focused on indigenous communities and education access. And I was like, how does that even relate? And she's like, you're using it right now. <laughs> Can't you think of other ways to utilize this? And that started this, this where I'm at now, this like sort of journey of how one, tech opened up so many doors and I didn't even realize it. And tech is also a very nebulous term. And I remember having to explain this back on the RAS because it was like, whoa, because I felt like I had found this like secret because once I got into that, like once the sort of this door opened then suddenly I was getting all these offers to do really cool things. I was getting invited to the Obama White House, which was blowing my mind. And I was getting to, to share my story along with like, uh, just participate in a lot of things and I would go back home and a lot of my friends are like how are you able to do this and I was like oh well I always equated it to tech so I was just like oh my god you guys should get into coding like it's so cool it's opening up all these doors and then then it became an issue of like well we want to but how and I had like I guess I hadn't thought about that foundational aspect of the tech problem like how do I get and that's that's what keeps a lot of people, especially young people from full participation in societies and cultures is this tech barrier. It's, and oftentimes, like if you're not aware of it, if you're not aware that there are people that still don't have access to not only Wi-Fi, but we're talking about electricity. I mean, two years ago, over 10,000 homes for the first time got electricity on the Navajo Nation. And the Navajo Nation, to give you an idea of how large it is, is larger than, the, than Ireland. It's larger than the state of Delaware and Rhode Island put together. And so it, if places like this in the US have these broad gaps, other places are gonna have it as well. And so a lot of people, at least where I'm from, they wanted to get involved. They had that curiosity, but they didn't have access to either Wi-Fi or computers or even people to explain like how this works. Cause not everyone, that's the other thing is, I've run into a lot of, I think, especially as women, like I've run into a lot of coders in the, or programmers in the tech industry who are just like, well, I learned it from a book or I did this and that's, and they consider that like the Bible for it all or the hand guide for all of us. And that's not always the case. Not everybody is going to be able to learn from a book and it doesn't mean it has no knock on their competency or anything. It's just some people are tactile learners. Some people learn through other, through other means. And that started this, this as, a, as just a side passion project. It was like, how do we get hackathons and workshops within my community? And then I started leveraging my experience because the more things I got to do, the more people were just like, well, I've never met a native who codes. But there's a lot of native who code and there's a lot of people from my community who want to get involved in this just don't have access so then i started leveraging that to get companies to like come onto the reservation and host events and as my career progressed i was getting more opportunities and i went from being this coder programmer like as my main means of employment to suddenly like oh, I can integrate my culture into it, or how can I use this to expand on my side passion projects? And what I do now, my official role is as a creative at a global creative firm. And that meant nothing to me when they reached out because creative is such a nebulous term because aren't we all creative? And I remember when they reached out and they were just like, would you like to, initially it was like six months, it was a creative residency and they're like, well, pay your housing. We just want you to make stuff. And I was like, that is the coolest thing to tell a programmer that they will provide um, basically all the foundational things you need and you just make stuff. But then it like, now that I've been in it for a little bit longer, I see where it's like, oh, like we have 
and granted, I am a sellout now. So I, the firm that I work with is working with major, major companies. So our budgets are so insanely different than they used to be. But you get to you get to work with 5G. You get to work. You get to create projects that um, I don't think I could have done in any other capacity. And it's so exciting for me. But it also makes me very aware of like, is this increasing the gap? How is this going to be like if now we're operating in this like a lot of AR and doing which AR is predicated on having like faster compute like you have to have like faster your Wi-Fi has to be better like you have to have a lot of materials to get to this point and so in the back of my head it's like this is really cool that I get to do this but at the same time is this widening the gap and how how can I still continue to pull my community on with me um, and I think again, this goes back to like why I think hackathons and why I think going back to my community and still being involved and getting people access is so important because I see technology as sort of a provider of this social cohesion and it's a, it's a way of inclusion in social societies. Um, tech allows us to connect with people not only across the country but across the world but it also introduces so many other worlds to us that was what I fell in love with I always said I fell in love with the internet as a kid but it was really like falling in love with the fact that I could I could read somebody else's thoughts across the country who I didn't necessarily I might not see those people in my own community but I'm meeting somebody across the world who has that same exact interest and that same exact weird thing or has that same exact weird question and that that makes the world sort of a better place when you're aware that one, you're not alone and other people feel the same way, but how do you, like good that I was able to feel that, but how am I able to pass this on to others and how can like we sort of complete the circle in a sense? And again, one of the other things that I see a lot with, especially young people is not only do they have this like ability to adapt quickly to new technologies and sort of like, they just want to try them out all, all on, which is, insanely cool and but how do you go from like remaining just a user to becoming like a critical and competent actor as like the European Science Journal has put it like who can exploit these virtual experiences in order to increase his or her own culture and social and economic capital meaning how do you guys go from just being somebody who enjoys TikTok to somebody who can build TikTok and I think that that sort of a question a lot of people have and that's the transparency that I don't don't see and I feel like I got really lucky because I was able to go from somebody who just enjoyed reading other people's words or enjoyed seeing other people's projects to somebody who gets to create those projects but how can and now I'm aware of how can I pass this on to other people and so how can other people get into these positions where they're the ones especially because you guys are fueling this technology, you guys are one of the main factors behind why people keep pushing out, you know, ripoffs of TikTok or ripoffs because it's people are like, how do we engage? There's so many people on this. How do we engage them when it's like you guys can flip the script and be like, it's not about engaging us. It's why don't we engage the market since we're the ones that they want? Um, and so again, I think this is just sort of a larger philosophy of any time you start, which is a normal progression of life, like leaving and moving to a different place, uh, whether literally or figuratively, there's a sense of how do you, how do you bring others with you? How do you open that door for other people and make it accessible for other people and break this down so other people can join you? Cause you don't, I often as an, not even as a woman, but as an indigenous person, like I often find myself, people are just like, you're the first native who's done this or the first native who's done that. And that isn't as much of a, I've never viewed that as a positive thing. Like it's kind of sad in 2020 that you can be the first woman this or the first native that, like we, sh we should have progressed past that as a society, but we haven't. And so I think armed with that sort of dislike of that phrase, there really is this like underlying push of, okay, other people need to be in this and other people need to have access to that because I will be the first to admit, I'm, 
I, I never really thought my coding skills were that great. I thought it was more just, I had a lot of free time and cause I was 11. And I also just had this natural curiosity for like, how does this work? Or like, how are they making that thing scroll? And you know, it's something as basic as like, how does this thing work? And then breaking that down. Or I remember when Raspberry Pi, um, I don't know if it was the inception of Raspberry Pi or it was the first time that I was just able to get my hands on it. But it was the coolest thing because it was like, here you have this computing power that's only $5, but it, you're able, as long as you have like the creativity behind it and the time to build it and the know-how to build something competent to something that's like $200 or, or I don't know, money becomes, it's, it's hard to, to quantify the worth of those kind of projects because it, it's so much more than that. Because once you learn Python or once you learn this, it really is uh, sort of limitless what you can build. Um, oh, we yeah. have a question. Um, okay. How do you suggest that we be allies to the indigenous community in our workplaces? Well, first, uh, having that question is, is the important part. And you, while that seems very obvious, that's not happening all the time. There's this idea of, I'm just not going to acknowledge this group. Or what I would run into a lot is, well, we don't have an affinity group for indigenous people. So just join this group or this group, or there's this idea of like scooping us under other rugs. And I think one of the things people need to remember is how complex indigenous groups are within the US alone. And again, granted, there's indigenous groups all over the country and our cultures are old, older than these borders. <laughs> That's another thing for people to remember. So one of the biggest things when you're talking about indigenous groups, if we're talking about specifically like indigenous groups in the US, there's 574 federally recognized tribes in, in Alaskan villages in the US alone. And I believe it's 326 villages, pueblos, and rancherias that are recognized by the government. That is incredibly diverse. Like I, the languages I speak are not necessarily, even our language base is different than when I go to the Southwest or when you know our language base is Algonquin and they might be speaking a language base of Athabascan and there's 20 varieties of it. So when you're talking about being an ally, acknowledging the diversity and the complexity of indigenous people, but also providing space for them that is space for indigenous people and not space of, okay, I don't want you to be alone, so I'll welcome you to this other group. That's beautiful, but they also need space that is just for them. And then it's also, this isn't a minor thing. When people talk about microaggressions, I don't necessarily always view them as micro. To the person saying it, it might be micro because I realize a lot of people's vernacular, they haven't, in the US, there's such anti-indigenous sentiment that we don't even realize. Like when you look at the Declaration of Independence, it literally guarantees like freedom for all. And then it name checks us as merciless Indian savages lines later. And I don't think people even acknowledge this. And I look around and all I see is anti-Indigenous. I mean, we have, we're mascots to a lot of people. We're Halloween costumes to a lot of people. We're wall ornaments to a lot of people. We're butter package mascots. We're like, there's, there's this idea that we don't exist anymore. There's this idea that we're a relic to a lot of people. And I think, I think not only acknowledging that Indigenous people are in the building, but amplifying that, but also doing your work to it shouldn't be on me as an indigenous person. I get very tired when I have to be like, you can't wear that, that's offensive because somebody wants to wear some sort of sports team paraphernalia that, yeah, it may mean a lot to them because they grew up watching it, but they're not even understanding how that hurts me as a person, how that undermines my agency as even a human being. And so if you're a good ally, you will be aware of this. You will be the one to talk to that person and say, hey, maybe don't wear this in this building because of this reason, or maybe don't wear it at all. Um, also, you will, you'll be the one to sort of, it's, it's unfair for anyone to have to police people's languages, but it's really unfair for the indigenous person to have to sit there and be like, 
please don't use the word powwow when you want to say have a meeting or please don't say Lois on the totem pole or please don't say uh, you're so off the reservation. And people are like, when I've told people this before, they're like, well, I've never said that because it's so commonplace for them to say it that they don't even realize. Yeah, they don't realize that they're saying it. They don't know this. And then I start to feel kind of crazy and I feel gaslit and I feel further frustrated that I feel further isolated. I feel further alone. I feel further um, just marginalized. And so taking it upon yourself to be an ally means a lot more than just providing space, I guess I should say. It means being aware of these issues that are going on and sort of protecting, or I wouldn't say protecting, but it should fall on other people to keep that away from the indigenous person because it is tiring at the end of the day. And again, in a lot of spaces, I'm, I'm the first full-time indigenous uh, creative at this building and it's a global firm and I'm personally tired. And then it's also, there's this weird phenomenon in the US of indigeneity becoming some sort of hobby. Um, so the cool thing about being indigenous is well, indigenous itself really isn't a race. Like, Mohican is my race. Like, but it's a, you talk about race, culture, and ethnicity. And they're actually three different things. And they tend to get conflated as one in the US. And so I often have a lot of people that will come up to me and are like, oh, you're indigenous. And this sounds really crazy, but this happens a lot. Like, I don't know how to explain being indigenous to other people, but it's like people will come up to you and tell you the weirdest things. Like, well, my grandmother like was a Cherokee princess and you're just sitting there like, I don't know what to do with this knowledge, but cool. But also that specifically is impossible, but like, cool. Um, but that kind of stuff further marginalizes me because it makes me think like, oh, they don't view, they don't view it as a real cult, like a living culture. They view it as some sort of thing that you can just tack on to a sentence. And it's specifically in that case, that, that, got under my skin and I really kind of did a number on me because I remember that was at a building where somebody was wearing Chief Wahoo, which is like a sports mascot, a really offensive sports mascot. They kept wearing that shirt and I was constantly like having to like bring this up to like, I brought it up to the person, I brought it up to other people. And I remember people being like, I don't get what the big deal is about this. And so I'm feeling already sort of gaslit and just agitated and then I have people coming up to me telling me that they're native and it's like, well, why didn't you notice this too? And they're like, well, I didn't even notice it. And it was like, well, perhaps you're not an active part of the culture. You may be native, but like being aware of the culture, being aware of that and not just using it from some sort of, I hate the word clout, but like, I don't know why that stuck in my head. But I think, I think we see that a lot too, where it's like people will just bomb onto stuff. So sorry, I rambled a bit on that question. Thank but, you so much. It was so interesting. And again, like I can't relate because I'm not of that culture. I'm Jewish. So I can definitely relate to all of that culture. But again, also it's like part of like being part of the community and me, I'm reform, which means I'm not super active and you are, and there's other people who aren't like, I didn't even know like how many levels there was. And like, this is like really insightful. Thank you. And then we have another question. Have yeah. You gone, when, yeah. Just, just to jump on that. I think that's the other thing that comes up a lot is like this idea of how native are you? And I think when, if you extract that and put or substitute and put any other group in there, it's, it's an offensive question overall. There's no perfect way to be native. Like I, like I have an attachment to the reservation and I grew up in a sort of a half like traditional family. So of course, like my understanding and my knowledge is going to specifically be of my tribe and of my experience, but that doesn't mean that somebody who doesn't grow up on a reservation isn't native or somebody who doesn't have that experience isn't native. It's more about recognizing like, I can't speak for all natives, that my experience is very much my experience. Um, but I also don't, but I'm also aware, like I've, I've worked in the space for long enough. I've worked in these communities long enough where my experience talking about it is valid. It doesn't mean it's the rule. But yeah, I think when you talked about being reformed, it made me think of that. Thank you so much. Okay, and then here's our next question. Have you gotten others on the reservation to start coding? What resources do you utilize? 
Okay, well, so it initially started off because we started doing these workshops and then before I moved on to Hack Aces and we can get into that in a second. But I, so when I was back at Diné College, which again is one of the, there's 37 tribal colleges in the US, we're located on the Navajo Nation. And we just started doing little like, they weren't even official workshops so much as I just thought it was really cool. So I was like, oh, like, hey guys, look at this like look what you can do with html and then i found out about scratch and i know scratch is aimed usually at a much younger generation but the cool thing about scratch is you can use it at any age and it is one of the easiest ways i feel to get people involved especially like on a larger level if you're i would never say that i was really teaching other people how to code because i was i don't again i don't think i'm as like proficient as sometimes like articles might make me seem or even like sometimes I come across. So I've always had some sort of like, I wouldn't say insecurity, just the lack of confidence in my own skills. Whereas I, but it's a lot easier for me to like do than say. And so with Scratch, it was cool because you could sit there and like work on it while other people are working on it as well and it was kind of helpful plus I didn't have any capital like there was no for like the first two years of doing these workshops they were solely grassroots there was never an idea of like this is a movement or this is a grassroots thing so much as that's just what it was and so whether we were hosting these little like coding events and I wanted them to be hackathons but I wasn't I didn't know how to go about creating a hackathon in the very beginning. Like there was no, like how do you create a, a hacker space or how do you create a maker space? And when I say hackathon, um, I should also, I should also like acknowledge the fact hackathon itself, the word was very exclusive. And I realized that kept a lot of people out from participating because a lot of people were like, I don't even know what that is or else they're like hacker. That sounds, bad and I don't want any part of it. And I remember, well, I'll jump back to like how Hack Aces came about. So once I had, I got enough confidence from doing these small mini events that again, were sort of impromptu. They were never official. I, I lucked into this uh, because of what I was doing outside of this. I remember running into the head of Aces and Aces for those of you that are, aren't aware, it's American Indian Science and Engineering Society. It's the largest group of it, it's a national corporation, um, they're or a national organization, they're incredible, and they're able to, to reach a lot of different groups at once. Because one of the things about Indian countries, we're still very, very fractured, we're very isolated. So what goes on on the Navajo Nation may not reverberate over an Ojibwe or Chippewa or Cree. And so when you have a national organization of, Ameri of, of indigenous people, getting attached to that, I thought, I was like, wow, this can expand it. So I saw the head, her name is Sarah Echo Hawk. She's incredible. And I remember running up to her and I was like, hey, you don't know me, but I have this like event that I would like to do at your convention. I don't have any money, but, and I remember like, I felt like I freaked her out, but I had just shot the show with Microsoft and it hadn't aired yet. But I, that when we're talking about leveraging positions, I leveraged that because I had the trailer on my cracked phone and I remember being like, look, look, I know this sounds crazy, but like I just did this thing with Microsoft and I feel like when people hear another organization, whether or not this is valid, Microsoft could be like, stop using our name. But like at the time that added some sort of validity to me, I wasn't just this crazy woman running up to her. I was like, hey, look, like I'm involved in tech and we've been doing these little like events. Would you be able to provide some space at your national convention to host one and what was so crazy was well she was like I'll have my assistant contact you so I'm thinking it was a polite way of saying no then two days later the assistant contacted me and at this time I was I was like a junior or a sophomore in college and she contacts me and she was just like yeah but you got to run it and I remember thinking oh uh, well I just thought we would have a space, but now it's like an official thing. So now I got to figure out how to run it. And that's why when, when Women Mean Business reached out, the idea of like high school students creating this and running this space is incredible. Or when anytime I can, I can help that out because I remember being so grateful that 
engineers were willing, I didn't have any money for them and I didn't have this, but because ACES had provided that space, which provided that validity to this event, because prior to, like when I would talk to companies, a lot of people would tell me, I don't think there's, there's space for this, meaning not space, like physical space, but there's no space for natives in tech, or I don't think that many people would be interested in this. And I'm saying like, I'm seeing this at these little events that we're doing. So they were able to provide space and that became the first national like collegiate hackathon for indigenous folk. And then that just sort of, once you get that, then, then there's this domino system. So, but at that first one, I remember because I had never run something that large or something that legitimate. So I remember I had it planned out that I, I had asked around, I borrowed people's Chromebooks, I borrowed whatever, whatever laptops I could. I got, I put scratch on all of them. Cause I was like, okay. And I had like a list of what we were going to learn. <laughs> and none of this happened during the first hackathon. It turned into a totally different thing. And we just started like, building um i think we're someone was nice enough to bring raspberry pi so also be very flexible when you're talking about on a res reservation and you start coding um but also what i've learned over the years of just working with on reservations is ask the community what they want to build first so because that's how you engage people they might not know how to code but they know what they're passionate about and so over time i I feel like I'm still I have a long way to go before I'm polished, but over time, what I've learned is if I go into a community that hasn't had a lot of exposure to programmers, but I'm like, well, what are you guys interested in? Um, one of my favorites was over on Salish Kootenai, which is Flathead Reservation. We were talking about this in the dorms and it was like, well, what are you guys interested in? And they mentioned MMIW, which stands for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. It's a huge movement in Indian country. It's, very, um, it's a very serious issue. It's very important. And a lot of people go to school to do research specifically on this topic. And so they were interested in that. So it was like, well, can we build something around this? So we started building something to support MMIW. We were building, I believe, a database. But it was one of those things where a lot of people were coding to support their passion. Like, I don't think they even realized that they were coding so much as it was like, okay, this is kind of frustrating that like, anytime you code, it's frustrating. But like, um, this is kind of frustrating, but it's getting me closer to this overall goal of building this database. It's, you know, so I think my main, when you talk about what resources do you utilize? It's, I would say other people's passions, like go in there and ask people what they want to build or what they're interested in and then build around that. Um, and if you don't have any money, I always, again, Scratch is one of the best resources. I also think there's a lot of organizations out there that are incredible. And if you reach out to them, like Girls Who Code. Yeah, I was gonna um, go over that. <laughs> yeah, they're, they are one of the greatest in terms of they have their projects on the website and they have like what programs they utilize. But what they have even more than that is this amazing network of people. So you can reach out to them and they might be able to provide stuff for you. Yeah, and then, and you're actually part of the network is that's how I learned about yeah, you. Both Sydney this, and I uh, did Girls Who Code this past summer. <laughs> and I don't know if Jordana did, but we'd have like, we, her session was shorter, but I learned like about a new woman in tech and these were um, women of color because, again, we always, the women that we hear, like, they're just white women and, you know, well, that's not necessarily true. But I'm just saying that they'd always feature women of color. And then I heard your story and you were, like, the first Native American, like, I don't know if it was, like, ever or something, but you were, like, a trailblazer. And I was, like, w we need her. <laughs> That's really sweet. I'm seeing a question from Victoria Chang on here, and it was, what challenges have you faced while trying to get more people involved in tech? Um, one of the biggest, I think there's levels in terms of like, in the very beginning, it was just not having money or resources or also having the knowledge of what I was doing. Um, but that, I think that's sort of a normal challenge. That's kind of the learning curve that anytime you start trying to build something or make something, where do you even begin? Um, later on, though, it became proving to people that this was valid, which was really frustrating because that has nothing to do with the tech that we were doing. That has nothing to do with our abilities as 
as coders or programmers. It was more, why am I having to prove to X company that native people are interested in tech? Um, and I guess that's where, that's where this overall idea of representation of indigenous people is super important because a lot of people can't fathom still in 2020 can't fathom the idea of indigenous people on the reservation having computers there's still this idea of us in teepees and yeah, a lot of us could be in teepees like but we could still have computers like there isn't that's the thing and that's why i think the younger generation is great because they know how to balance living in two worlds um they know how to balance virtual world and physical world and then on top of that when you start adding cultures into it there's mainstream culture and there's there's the culture that you grow up in and whether or not that intersects that's one thing but when you're able to balance all these different worlds that's great a lot of these companies though have been around for multiple generations and they still do things by the book so trying to convince them that this is a safe venture or that I shouldn't say safe, but that's sort of how it would come across because I had companies to my face tell me that they just didn't see, they just didn't see a benefit to getting natives involved because overall, if we're 1% of the population or 2% of the population, what is, what are they going to see from this? And that's frustrating because you're like, well, you should care about it. Even if it was just one person in, you know, a billion, you should care about it, but you also realize, okay, fine, this is just a, an obstacle and how am I gonna get around it? And that's, that's when I started becoming more aware of the words that I use. So I went from using specifically like Mohican or American Indian or within the community we use Indian, but outside of it, you probably shouldn't. Um, so, but using native is still very, these are still very nebulous terms, but I found indigenous to be more encompassing. It was also like inclusive for a lot of people who are indigenous to like, other regions and just happen to be on US soil because then it, I, f I don't know, we, we get a lot of diversity at these events. I don't wanna say off the top of my head that we are getting like a lot of South Americans or a lot of or people from New Zealand or stuff. But at the same time, I think the biggest challenge is sort of remaining confident and focused that this is something that is important. Is silly that's not silly but like as as weird as that sounds I think that was the main thing because I would sometimes get very very discouraged because it's like why am I doing this like this isn't something that I'm doing I mean this isn't at all how I like I've never charged for these and I don't make any money from them so it's definitely like it's a little more than a hobby for me it's a huge passion but it's not something that has ever been my livelihood and so when I would get so defeated from this or I would you know, I'd have a company tell me to my face that they didn't see indigenous people in tech. And I'm just like, well, I'm, I'm literally sitting here. And that would, it would cause me to kind of go into my shell. And I wouldn't, I just wasn't as proactive right after it. So maintaining that sort of confidence that what you're doing is valid, what you're doing is great. And that all it takes is one person to hear this and be like, yes, I'm going to jump on this. As far as like, uh, Victoria also asked, are there any books I would recommend to further encourage allyship pertaining to the indigenous community? Off the top of my head, I don't have like a specific book title, but I can tell you the names of some incredible uh, people out there doing work who talk a lot about allyship within indigenous community. So you have Dr. Adrian Keene, who I believe is at Brown University right now, but she has, um, she's pretty accessible online. Um, you can find her on Twitter, Instagram. There's also Rebecca Nagel, who runs a few different podcasts, and she's an incredible journalist, but she also t writes a lot about allyship pertaining to Indigenous communities. Um, I would say Twitter. I know, I know people like to, like, bash on it or, like, downplay its significance, but it's a great way to find a lot of people speaking on these things. And one of the the biggest things though is, well, how do you know that they're a, a, a valid person in a sense? Like, how do you know that, because everyone can use Twitter and everyone can write about it. Well, see, see what other journals or publications they've written for. So if you, like I would go onto Twitter now probably and I would type in uh, allyship indigenous community and I would see what pops up. And if 
then I would look at the person and it's like, oh, have they published for these journals or are they publishing for indigenous communities? Because there's a lot of people that want to write about us, but have no actual like interaction with us. And so some of the best, well, the only uh, tribal college journal that's out there is Tribal College Journal. And it's a publication that is supported by AHEC, which is the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. And they oversee all 37 tribal colleges. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry I don't have the exact book title off the top of my head, but I feel like Adrienne Keene is somebody who I really like her writing, um, and I, uh, specifically on race and allyship. Um, who are, oh, Saxon Kennedy asked, who were my role models, especially women or indigenous people while getting into tech and starting to run your own events? Um, oh, that's a great question. So, wow. I would say Dr. Shirley McBay is the very first, um, she was the mentor that was like, what are you doing? Why aren't you in tech? She also happens to be, she was the first black dean at MIT in the eighties. She is an incredible woman. Um, she's an incredible person. She's a mathematician, just one of the biggest proponents of education and getting people into PhD programs. Um, she is somebody who I not only look up to, but I constantly think, would this make her proud? <laughs> um, but yeah, Dr. Shirley McBay, I didn't grow up knowing about her though. And that was frustrating because I feel like even with like Dr. Keene or Rebecca Nagel or um, uh, Marigolda Ross, who was like the first native coder, um, she coded stuff that was used, I think, uh, to send rockets to space, um, which is a very like dumbed down version of what she actually does. But a lot of these people I didn't grow up knowing. And so like, I, as a kid, I looked up to, um, I think I looked up to a lot of fictional characters, which when people want to downplay that, it was really helpful to me, which again is why I like the internet so much because it exposed me to a lot of different things that I wouldn't have known in my, in in my sort of sheltered world. Um, and my sheltered world had nothing to do with being on a reservation so much as just being very marginalized, having, um, not having access to a lot of outdoor stuff. And when you're dealing with very impoverished communities, what people often remember is our hierarchy of needs is a little different. So <laughs> if anyone ever makes you feel bad for not knowing like, a band or not knowing like i don't know something that seems really important to them just remind them that you were probably dealing with something else at that time while they were learning about the beatles and the velvet underground and yeah these these may be really cool bands but i remember it's like we were just trying to get by like my parents were working multiple jobs just trying to get by and so i didn't have that like that introduction that when i talked to a lot of um other people they may have grown up in knowing um knowing some of these people like mary golda ross or dr shirley mcveigh because that's somebody that's like oh i would want to teach my kids about her um who else i look up to sarah echo hawk who runs um aces right now she's the ceo of it um dr sarah echo hawk i look up to um dr Lori alvard who's the first native surgeon and she's just incredible and she's written some books about actually her books may pertain to allyship but have nothing to do with tech but they still pertain to allyship to indigenous communities and she wrote scapel and the silver bear um who there's just a wealth of people lucy tapahanso um i I look to a lot of people for my own communities i've been very privileged in the sense that i've been able to meet incredible incredible people who I'm starstruck by, but it's also like, well, they're great. And this will give me something to brag about, but at the same time, like, who do I know that's making a direct impact in my community and who's directly impacted me? So yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel really bad because I know I'm leaving so many people out. Um, and oh, Dr. Miranda Haskey, who was just a, a professor I had my freshman year, and it was the first time I ever met an indigenous woman with a PhD that wasn't a doctor. And in fact, I hadn't even met a doctor at that point. So yeah. Um, 
I don't, I, I feel like I'm running short on time. Well, I feel like I ran over time, so. You're good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, just like, just a little thing to add. I love how you said like perspectives and stuff that there isn't room in the workspace for indigenous people. And I actually wrote my college essay about this, how like I feel that in order to like be able to sell a product, for example, to everyone, you have to include every perspective. And in the workforce, we're lacking the indigenous perspective. And I just thought it was really interesting that you brought that up. Yeah, and just anyone drop in the chat. Yeah, if anyone has any final questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I also wrote the, um, the two uh, women that Robin mentioned, I wrote their names in the chat um, in case anyone wants to reference them afterwards. All right, well, I think that's it. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to speak to us. And yeah. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Robin. Thank right, you and guys. Um, and have a wonderful, uh, this so thing sounds incredible. <laughs> All right. Yeah.